Welcome back, Revis, to our study of the Russian Revolution. This video is going to look at the Russian Civil War. The war itself began in December 1917 with the Battle of Rostov and ended in late 1920. Uh, we're going to look at five major topics in this video. We're going to look at the reasons for the Civil War, the different sides that fought, in the Civil War, who won and why, the effects of the Civil War, particularly on obviously on the Bolshevik Party, and then finally um, our most favourite of topics, historical interpretations of the Civil War. You can see in the middle of the screen there a poster by Alexander Aspit, which is a recruitment poster for the Red Army from 1919. There are lots and lots of these types of posters produced both by the Reds, the Bolsheviks, as well as by the Whites to promote their cause and for various reasons. Uh, this one here, obviously, as I just stated before, is a recruitment poster, but there are other types of posters with different purposes as well, and there are a number of these in this presentation. So as I go through it, uh, we'll have a little, uh, I'll explain what they uh, their relevance to our study of the Civil War. And there is a quote here which is related to propaganda, which I think um, is important to understand, an insight into Lenin's mind and his thoughts about propaganda. The art of any propagandist and agitator consists in his ability to find the best means of influencing any given audience by presenting a definite truth in such a way as to make it most convincing most easy to digest, most graphic, and most strongly impressive. The key phrase there, I think, is definite truth. So uh, the basis of all this propaganda is truth. I suppose the question is, how is that truth presented to the viewer? And that's what we're going to look at in greater detail now. So let's continue. Let's begin with reasons for the Civil War. So the reasons for the Civil War. Now, we looked at this in our last uh, video about the uh, crushing or the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. So one reason, one cause of the Civil War was that crushing of the Constituent Assembly on the 6th of January 1918 by the Bolsheviks. Um, and I remind you that the uh, Constituent Assembly was uh, the, the party that held the most seats at the Constituent Assembly was the uh, Socialist Revolutionaries. Their leader, Viktor Chernov, was the chairman, and obviously they weren't happy about having their constituent assembly dissolved, so they were one of the groups that were not uh, that fought uh, against the Bolsheviks during the Civil War. Another reason for the Civil War was Lenin wanted a civil war. He actually wanted one because he thought it was better to have a short, brutal struggle than a long, drawn-out resistance. So Lenin was a very... Uh, he had studied history and he had studied in particular the French Revolution like so many of these other other uh, Bolshevik leaders and revolutionaries and the lessons that he had learned from that study of the French Revolution was there was that there was probably going to be a civil war because when the revolutionaries get into power there are people who have been overthrown groups who have been overthrown or groups who wanted to get in, into power themselves and they try to overthrow the revolutionaries and put themselves back in power or attain power. So they are the counter-revolutionaries. Uh, so yes, Lenin was uh, fully aware that a civil war would probably break out and wanted one when he got into power. He also wanted to, uh, yes, have, a, have the civil war in order to um, uh, do away with all of his enemies quickly rather than have a long drawn out uh, resistance. Uh, and the quote down there is very relevant for this, and it's from Lenin's Socialism and War, 1915, and gives an insight into his attitude towards civil war. We fully regard civil wars, i.e. wars waged by the oppressed class against the oppressing class, slaves against slave owners, serfs against landowners, and wage workers against the bourgeoisie as legitimate, progressive, and necessary. So he saw civil war as a legitimate act in order to defend the revolution. Uh, another reason for the civil war were the Bolsheviks' refusal to work with the other parties, for example, the SRs or the cadets. 
and from um, when it was first created, the Bolsheviks and Lenin, Lenin in particular, did not like working with other parties. Uh, even before the October Revolution, when he criticised, uh, for instance, Kamenev and Stalin uh, after the February 1917 revolution in March with his letters of, from afar, when he was criticising those Bolshevik leaders who were working alongside other revolutionary uh, or political groups in the post-February 1917 uh, weeks. And the euphor euphoria at that time, he criticised them for actually working with these other groups, saying, no, it is wrong. We have to stick to our aims, our purpose. And then we've got there as well uh, the first major battle of the Civil War was fought at Rostov in southern Russia, beginning on the 9th of December 1917, and then it's spread from there. The photo we have is of Lenin addressing uh, Bolshevik soldiers in 1920. You can see Lenin up there, and if you look to uh, down below here, you can see Trotsky looking in the opposite direction to him. There are other versions of this photo or photos that are taken at the, of this same, um, this same event where Lenin's addressing Bolshevik soldiers and it has Trotsky actually staring at the camera. Get a better look at him. Anyway, let's keep going. The different sides. So, the two major sides were the Reds, the Bolsheviks, and the Whites, and for want of a better word, the anti-Bolsheviks. And then there was another group called the Greens, and we'll look at them too. Before we get into looking at these three different groups, so just have a look at this map here, and just study it very quickly. So, when we look, the Reds, we'll see, control the area around Petrograd, Moscow, and this sort of area around here, the sort of industrial heartland of Russia, which also they control the major uh, railway networks and so forth. Their enemies, the forces uh, who were fighting against them, be they whites and greens, were um, always on the periphery, okay, on the borders of these areas. So we can see General Yudinich, he came in from Estonia, and then he marched on Petrograd. He never actually got there, but we'll see uh, in a sec that he was fighting up here against Petrograd. In the south here, we have Denikin. And Denikin's front, he, he got to about here. That was his, his farthest advance. Um, and then, uh, oh, actually it was here. He got right up to here. Okay, so he starts here. March 1918, uh, 19, by the 1st of August 1919, he's here, and then he manages to get all the way up to there, all right? But that's as far as he gets. The other opposing force, white force, was coming in from the east, and that was uh, Admiral Kolchek's uh, forces. Uh, the, Czech, the Czech Legion was in here. Um, and I think the distance here, these two, these two armies, these two white armies never actually uh, reached each other, but they did get oh, about 60 kilometres, something like that, away from each other. And supposedly they could hear each other's gunfire firing at the Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks uh, managed to keep them apart. And we'll see why that was so important as well. So we have white forces up here. We have Dnikin's forces here. We have um, Kolchak's forces there. The Poles, the Polish War happens uh, in, in 1920 and sort of tacked onto the Civil War. And then you have these other green groups down here. And the most famous is Makhno. And we're going to learn a lot more about Makhno down here. Uh, and there's Rostov. So that's where the war actually starts there, the Civil War. And that spreads just everywhere. These white forces, we'll see, were supported by both the British and the French. British and the French, particularly down here, um, through the Black Sea, and Udenich as well, uh, was supported by the British and the French up here. So let's keep going, let's have a look at the Reds. So the Reds, the Reds were the Bolsheviks and their supporters. And when we're talking about the supporters, if you look at this very famous poster by Dimitri Moore, uh, Dimitri Moore and Victor Denis, uh, 
are the two, I suppose, most famous of the Bolshevik propagandists, poster creators, artists, graphic artists. Um, and this Death to World Capitalism, 1919, is Dimitri, one of Dimitri Moore's, Moore's most famous posters. And when we're talking about uh, the Bolshevik supporters, well, you can see them down here. So we have <clears throat> peasants, workers, sailors, and you could refer, this is probably an allusion to the Kronstadt sailors, those heroes of the October 1917 revolution who fight on the Bolshevik side throughout the Civil War period. Um, and uh, Red Army, okay? Red Army, uh, Red Army there. They start out as Red Guards and then uh, Trotsky turns the Red Guards into a very formidable Red Army. And then uh, going back to, if you remember, back to the map that we just saw before. So the Bolsheviks controlled that central um, concentrated region around Moscow and Bol uh, Petrograd. Their leader, the man who ran the war effort upon uh, behalf of the Bolsheviks, was Trotsky. He was the war minister uh, and Lenin assigned him the role of fighting the war. He was a brilliant tactician and strategist uh, and orator, if you can, as you can see in this uh, photo of him, Trotsky addressing the Red Guard. Well, I would say they're actually uh, they're, uh, Red Army soldiers by this stage. Okay, so uh, Trotsky became the Commissar for War after the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in March 1918. So he attended the negotiations with the German High Command to sign the treaty with the Russians to pull Russia out of the war against the Germans. And uh, he was successful there. However, yes, as a consequence, uh, Russia lost the Ukraine. Eventually they get it back, but uh, they did lose it to Germany for a time. Trotsky created the Red Army. He also led the Red Army during the Civil War, throughout the Civil War. And he had a few uh, key aspects to his strategy. So firstly, um, and it was a successful strategy, he wanted to defend the Red Army's internal lines of communication. Uh, so that means defending the area around Moscow and Petrograd, making sure the Whites didn't cut any of those uh, railways that connected those two areas or uh, the other major industrial cities in that central area. Um, and he wanted to stop the Whites from concentrating large forces. So if we remember back to the map where we have Denikin's forces, uh, General Denikin in the south, uh, trying to stop, for instance, Denikin's forces uh, connecting up with Admiral Kolchek in the east from Siberia. And he also wanted to disrupt the white supplies as much as possible. Uh, the Greens helped with that, particularly in the south as well. And he used a special armoured train as a military headquarters to lead the war effort. So he was constantly going from one front to another, defending Petrograd against Yudnich, then going to the east to fight Admiral Kolchak, and then going down to the south to inspire the troops to resist Denikin's push north towards Moscow from the Black Sea. Okay, the Whites. So the Whites, the Whites were uh, the Bolshevik opponents and they were pretty much made up of all the political groups um, or former Tsarist, former Tsarist supporters. So we've got monarchists hoping to res restore the Tsar. The Tsar isn't assassinated by the Cheka uh, until July 1918. So all the generals, the vast majority of the generals uh, who fought Russian generals, they sided with the monarchists or with the Whites, I mean, um, and until the Tsar was assassinated and his family was assassinated, they were hoping to restore him to power, to the throne. The other groups were parties outlawed or suppressed by the Bolsheviks, for example, the SRs, the cadets, and so forth. So we had this peculiar situation where you had different governments set up by the SRs, for instance, and they were war working alongside, allied with uh, monarchist generals. So the SRs were trying to, their aims for the revolution or what if they overthrew the Bolsheviks were very different, the society they wanted to create. 
if they overthrew the Bolsheviks, would be very different to the society that the monarchists would like to create if they overthrew the Bolsheviks. But these two disparate groups were allied, and we'll look at that in more detail as well. So the areas they controlled are on the periphery. So Samara on the Volga in the south, as well as the Caucasus region of southern Russia, Siberia in the east, and then to the north on the uh, one of the Baltic states, Estonia, up near the Baltic Sea. So when uh, you are discussing in the exam or in a SAC, responding to a SAC question or an exam question about the whites, it is good to refer to a specific general, give some specific information, specific examples of who these white uh, leaders were and where they operated. So, for instance, you can see General Denikin there, the circle with General Denikin, and you can say, specify that he fought in the Caucasus region of southern Russia. Or you could refer, for instance, to Cap Admiral, Col Admiral Kolchak, and he fought in the east in Siberia. Okay? So anyway, uh, oh, before we look at these particular generals, just let's have a look at this uh, another famous uh, poster by this time by Victor Denis, and it is entitled The Dogs of the Entente. So you have there three dogs, Denikin on the left, the beautiful black one in the middle, Kolchek, and then Yudinich on the right. And this poster depicts those white generals under the control uh, being handled by their American, French, and British masters. And you can see Uncle Sam there with a leash holding uh, Denikin, for example, dog Denikin. So a very, a very Bolshevik view of who was uh, supporting uh, these white groups, these counter-revolutionaries. So the Bolsheviks were very much uh, trying in their propaganda to convince people that the whites were really just an extension of foreign imperialists trying to take over uh, Russia. Okay, so a continuation of what Germany was pretty much trying to do during World War One. Okay, let's go to Admiral Kolchak. So there is a photo of him there. Uh, he led the Czech Legion. His location was Western Siberia. He launched his offensive with the Czech Legion in March 1919. The communists began pushing back in June 1919 and then Kolchak fled in November 19 and he was eventually assassinated, uh, executed by socialists, socialist revolutionaries in February 1920. He was captured by them uh, because of the way he had treated both them and then the people in the areas that he occupied. The next white general is General Denikin. So General Donikin, he led the volunteer army, and the volunteer army consisted of Tsarist loyalists as well as the outlawed cadets. Uh, his location was in the south, and we saw that back on the map there. He captured Oral 400, 400 kilometres south of Moscow in early October 1919, but then he was forced to retreat. So that was, uh, Oral was the uh, furthest north, his army reached during the Civil War, and then he was forced to retreat on the 20th of October 1919 as Makhno's anarchist army threatened his communications with the Black Sea, or the Black Sea ports, which were occupied by French and British soldiers. General Yudinich. General Yudinich, he led the White Army of Resistance, which we saw up in Estonia. Um, and Yudinich reached the outskirts of Petrograd in early October 1919. So that seems to be the high point. It was a high point of the Whites' fortunes in the Civil War, that October 1919, uh, when they managed to conquer as much as they could of Russia before all getting pushed back by the Bolsheviks. Trotsky came to the rescue, though, and he defended uh, Petrograd against Yudinich and then pushed him back to Estonia by the end of the month. And then finally, foreign support. So, lots of different foreign countries supported uh, the whites. And the reason, particularly why countries such as the French and the British uh, supported the whites was because uh, the Bolsheviks owed the French and the British money. 
Remember when the Bolsheviks got into power, one of their first things they did was they renounced all the foreign debts which had been accrued by the provisional government and before the provisional government by the Tsar in fighting uh, World War I, um, in fighting the Germans. Once the Bolsheviks got into power, they said, well, we didn't take out these loans, so we're not going to pay them back. Uh, and that made the French and the British very unhappy and they wanted their money back. It was owed to them. So they supported the whites in the hope of the whites winning and then getting uh, their money back. Alongside the French and the British, the Americans fought with Italians and Japanese, and they all occupied areas of Russia during the Civil War. The Americans and Japanese, they came in from Vladivostok, in from the Pacific and the Far East. Um, the French and the British uh, in the South, uh, and the British also had taken over Archangel in the North and were uh, shipping in supplies there to foreign support. Uh, the next point, they offered some help to whites, but they generally failed to coordinate their attacks effectively and their support was limited. Their support mostly came in arms and ammunition. They did send in troops, but uh, don't forget that the French and the British in particular, they just finished fighting World War I and their soldiers wanted to finish fighting. They wanted to stop fighting. They'd had enough of war. So back in France, back in Britain, support for intervention in the Russian Civil War amongst the British and the French populations uh, was not high. So um, that was reflected in how much these uh, foreign forces could do in Russia itself. Foreign troops began to withdraw from the end of 1919 onwards, once, once uh, those uh, white generals were being pushed back, which we just saw before. Okay. Now the Greens. The Greens, there were various, but the most famous was Macno. And there is a picture of Nestor Macno. Now you can't really see it here, but if you're really keen, go on to Google. There are lots of images of him, but you can just see there, he has this very big scar all the way down, I think, from pretty much his ear all the way to his lip there. Must have been a sword slash or something along those lines. Other photos uh, show it quite prominently. Uh, I chose not to include those photos. This one's a bit more um, chivalrous, and I thought, yeah, this would be a nicer picture of him. So that's in 1921. Um, he led the guerrilla resistance. He fought both the whites and the reds. He was a former Bolshevik, and he's, he aimed to establish an independent Ukraine. These green forces, what they wanted was uh, national independence, Ukraine being uh, the most significant of those. And here, this quote here is just from a diary account of one of the battles that Macno was involved in, and it was written by one of his supporters, Peter Ashinov. And it's when he's fighting Denikin. So I'll just read through this very quickly. Without a cry, but with a burning resolve fixed on his features, he, Macno, threw himself on the Denikinists at full gallop, followed by his escort and broke into their ranks. A hand-to-hand -hand combat of incredible ferocity, a hacking, as the Macnovists called it, followed. However brave the first officer's regiment of Simferopol, the Denikin unit, may have been, they were thrown into retreat. The other regiments, seized by panic, followed them, and finally all of Denikin's troops were routed and tried to save themselves by swimming across the Sinyuka River. Okay, now we get to who won and why. The Reds won. No surprise there. So who won and why, before we get into it. Uh, this is another Bolshevik poster, and it shows pretty much you're either with them or you're with us. That sort of uh, way of presenting this conflict. So... We have on the left there a worker, death to capital or death under the heel of capital. There is no middle way from this uh, poster's viewpoint. You either destroy capitalism or capitalism destroys you. Okay, so the Bolsheviks did win 
And why did they win? Well, they had several strengths. Let's have a look at them. So, red strengths. The main reasons why the Reds won the Civil War, the first one, the most significant one, was Trotsky's leadership of the Red Army and his superior organisational ability. So organisational ability, we've looked at this previously and in um, when we've studied the Tsar and one of the reasons why he was overthrown during the February 1917 revolution was his poor leadership and his poor organisation, particularly the railways and supply networks and things like that while he was in power, while Trotsky was a lot better at it than he was. Trotsky also improved the capacity of the army by enlisting large numbers of ex-Tsarist officers to train the rank and file into efficient soldiers. So he understood that these ex-Tsarist uh, officers, they were the experts, they knew how to fight, how to lead, so he enlisted them in the Bolshevik army. He made sure, though, we'll see in, down at point D there, that um, he had political commissars to watch over these ex tsarist officers to make sure they didn't betray the Bolsheviks. He increased discipline by imposing the death sentence for desertion or disloyalty. This was... Um, this uh, was a punishment that was given to soldiers prior to, in the Russian army, prior to February 1917. When uh, the revolution occurred in February 1917, uh, that was no longer uh, possible. The uh, provisional government stopped that punishment of soldiers. Uh, Trotsky reimposed it in order to uh, improve discipline. Trotsky also reintroduced ranks and address. So a captain was now called a comrade captain. And the point I said before, he also attached political commissars to the army to make sure ex-Tsarist officers remained loyal. Finally, he introduced conscription. So he forced peasants, workers into the army. And there were battalions that were, or platoons, battalions, groups of soldiers that were mostly made up of workers or other groups that were made up of peasants. The Bolsheviks found that the worker soldiers were often uh, the best fighting units. So the result of all of these uh, measures that Trotsky put in place, Trotsky turned the tired veterans and raw recruits of the Red Guards, which he had inherited in March 1918, into a formidable three million strong Red Army by 1920. Um, other reasons why the Bolsheviks won, the Reds' ability to keep themselves supplied. So I referred to this before about the areas that the Reds controlled. So they controlled during the Civil War. They controlled the industrial heartland of Moscow itself and armament factories in Petrograd and Tula. So this was a, a, a real difference between the Reds and the Whites. The Reds, the Bolsheviks, they were self-sufficient in arms and armaments. They made their own arms, their own rifles and so forth. They made, made their own, produced their own bullets. Okay, The whites had to get most of their supplies given to them by their foreign supporters, by the British and the French, for example. And another reason, another strength of the Reds was that they were able to maintain their lines of communication through control of the railways. So they were able to um, coordinate their various forces to work together because uh, the white forces were separated by geography, by distance. They couldn't, uh, often they couldn't actually coordinate their attacks to be uh, most effective and stretch the Bolshevik defences effectively enough. Other reasons why the Reds, uh, the Bolsheviks won, they were fighting a defensive war against a disunited enemy. Uh, the disunited enemy, uh, different aims, different locations, which the Whites had. We'll look at that in more detail soon. They also showed greater purpose and morale. So for the Bolsheviks, be they Bolshevik supporters, be they workers or peasants, they were defending the revolution. Time, the conditions during the Civil War for workers and peasants were harsh, whether they were uh, in Bolshevik occupied areas or white occupied areas. But the Bolsheviks had promised something to 
the workers and to the peasants which the whites had not. So the Bolsheviks, when they first came into power, I remind you, they passed out the decree on workers' control which gave uh, or recognised the workers' control over factories. Okay? And they also passed the decree on land which recognised the land seizures, the land that the peasants had taken over since February 1917. So... They, the Bolsheviks, promised after the Civil War, they'd pass these decrees and they promised to give the land to the peasants, the thing that the peasants wanted the most, and the workers' control over the factories. The whites, if they got into power, were not going to give either the peasants or the workers either of those things, either of those things, particularly the, you know, General Nikon or Udenich or Admiral Kolchak. Those generals, they wanted to go back, they wanted to return Russia to the way it was prior to the February 1917 revolution, where rich landlords controlled most of the land and the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, controlled uh, the factories. So uh, even though the workers and the peasants uh, didn't like, necessarily all of them didn't like the Bolsheviks, uh, they hated the whites more. So the Bolsheviks had the support of the majority of workers, and that final point there, yes, the peasants disliked the Bolsheviks less than the whites because the whites wanted to re-establish the old society and return land to nobility. And here is a, another poster here, this one by Dimitri Moore, Proletarians of All Land Unite, and you have... The three classes and these um, these these groups. It's very uh, a Marxist view or a class um, class interpretation of society here. So you have your workers, your peasants in the middle, and then your Red Army soldier there. Okay, so workers, peasants united behind the Red Army. And you can see, you can tell the worker, often workers are depicted with their sleeves rolled up. Got the hammer there. And this peasant here, um, he's got the long leggings because he walks out in the fields to stop the long leggings to stop any snow getting into his boots and so forth. Um, and that's probably what you can't see, but I would say that's a scythe there that it's holding. Okay. And then you have the Red Army soldier. With the red, uh, with the red star on his cap, and on his shirt, and he's got a sword behind, on his belt. Okay, white weaknesses. So I've already uh, referred to many of them, but we'll just go over these very quickly. So the main reason why the whites lost the civil war was disunity. The white armies fought separately. So all of these uh, these different white armies, they were uh, under the command of different white generals and they were separated geographically as uh, as well as their aims were very often very different too. So they did not have a single aim, these white groups. They could not produce a political program that united liberals such as Milyukov and SR such as Chernov with aristocratic landlords industrialists and conservative army officers. So Milyakov, well, he probably wanted, well, not probably, he wanted a parliament. The SRs, they would have wanted a parliament as well. But the SRs in particular, they would have wanted to give all the land to the peasants, like the Bolsheviks. But that's not what the aristocratic landlords wanted to do. All the industrialists, all the conservative army officers. So there was just, there was dispute, disunity within the white forces themselves. These different groups were not prepared to sacrifice their individual aims. Okay, so the SRs would not have been prepared to sacrifice their aim of giving land to the peasants. Okay, and the aristocratic landlords, well, they wouldn't want, would not have wanted to sacrifice their land. And then I've referred to this as well. Uh, these groups were separated by geography. No land connection between the separate white forces. Other reasons why the whites lost the civil war. They were too reliant on foreign supplies from the British and the French, and also they lacked leaders of Trotsky's ability. And uh, this quote here, this passage gives you an insight into the way um, 
the whites treated people in the occupied areas that they controlled. Uh, it's not to say that the Bolsheviks weren't as brutal uh, to the peasants in the areas that they controlled, but the whites were just as bad. And it's from General Budberg, who was a white general. The lads think that if they have killed and tortured a few hundred or thousand Bolsheviks, then they have done a great job inflicted a decisive blow on Bolshevism and brought the restoration of the old order nearer. The lads do not seem to realise that if they rape, flog, rob, torture and kill indiscriminately and without restraint, they are thereby instilling such hatred for the government they represent that the swine in Moscow must be delighted at having such diligent, valuable and beneficial collaborators. So what he is saying there is that the harsh treatment that the white armies uh, were giving to the peasants, the way they were treating the peasants and the people in the areas that they controlled, um, were turning those people away from the whites and instead making them Bolshevik supporters. Here is a poster of called General, uh, entitled General Alexander Kolchek, by Dimitri Moore, 1919, and this is an interesting poster because it has uh, these various classes which are common, um, seen as common exploiting classes or promoted or portrayed by Dimitri Moore and other uh, Bolshevik propagandists as exploiting classes in Russia at this time. So you have the capitalist giving uh, the the capitalist giving money to Kolchak. You have this man here, he, he is a rich peasant, and he is a kulak, so he's a, a kulak, so rich peasants, and he is giving food to a uh, to Kulchak. And then behind uh, Kulchak, we have uh, the priest or the clergy, who is seen as just propping up the old Tsarist regime. Okay. Okay, the effects of the Civil War, and the effects of the Civil War, this is particularly upon the Bolsheviks. So there's three things we need to understand. It had huge effects on the Bolshevik party itself, the way it was structured, um, and uh, what members uh, could and couldn't do after the Civil War uh, began. So, and it's been broken down, these effects have been broken down into three categories, toughness, authoritarianism, and centralization of the Bolsheviks, so toughness. So the Bolsheviks grew hardened by war. All members of the party demanded and accepted strict discipline in order to cope with various crises faced by the party during the Civil War period. So for example, and we've looked at, we've seen this in our study, there were times when Bolshevik members were uh, sometimes uh, criticized each other <coughs> where Bolshevik members sometimes criticised each other or criticised the leadership. We know that uh, within the leadership itself, not all leaders agreed with Lenin um, and tried to uh, stop him from doing things. Uh, one of the big examples, which we're going to see uh, further down here, is uh, the whole signing of the Treaty of brest Many Bolshevik leaders were not happy about that. Trotsky wasn't happy about it because... Uh, with the signing of the Treaty of brest Russia lost a lot to Germany, the main thing being uh, the Ukraine. So disputes within the party were totally stopped. And we have here Decision 7 from the 8th Party Congress, March 1919. The party finds itself in a situation in which the strictest centralism and most severe discipline are an absolute necessity. So those... Those Bolshevik members who started to cr criticise the leadership, they started to get purged from the party itself. And there we'll see there was a, there's actually a purge in that authoritarianism point in mid-1919. So, going down to authoritarianism. So the Bolsheviks resorted to coercion more readily as a result of the Civil War. The party became less democratic. Rank-and-file members no longer debated or rejected the decisions of the party leadership. And we've got that point there about the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. 
and party members were punished harshly for ill discipline, for disagreeing or creating factions within the party. And the example there is there was a party purge of those members who were seen as being disloyal. And a purge involves a uh, party member being expelled from the party and other disciplinary measures. The uh, final effect of the civil war upon the Bolshevik party was centralisation. So as a consequence of centralisation, power moved away from the party or the party members to subcommittees. And there were three subcommittees and each of these subcommittees uh, were staffed by leaders of the Bolshevik party. So Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Kamenev, Zinoviev, etc. Kolontai. So the first subcommittee was the Politburo and the Politburo, a bit like a ministry, made major policy decisions. The Org Bureau implemented the decisions made by the Politburo and then the Secretariat, and this is a very interesting one, um, it kept records of party members and appointed them to positions within the party. It was uh, not seen at the time as oh, many members within the Bolshevik party didn't see how powerful the Secretariat was. The leader or the head of the Secretariat, Stalin, certainly did. So Stalin became General Secretary of the Communist Party in May 1922. And what happened was Stalin could appoint his own uh, loyal followers into positions of power, people he didn't like or people, uh, Bolshevik members who he uh, didn't trust. He sent them out into positions far, far away, for instance, Siberia. And Bolshevik members soon learned that if they wanted to have uh, the better positions in Petrograd and Moscow, then uh, they started following what Stalin asked them to do. And his control over the Secretariat led to his eventual control over the party, um, which happens later. I chose uh, this poster here, uh, and it's uh, the, we don't know who the author is, but its uh, it title is Dear Illich, We Remember Your Command. So when uh, Lenin passed away, in 1924, a number of these sort of posters were created um, and the cult of personality, the, cult, the hero worship of Lenin uh, was promoted by the party. Um, and in this one, you have all of these women saying, yes, we will follow, what, follow you, we remember what you stood for and we, we will do that too. And finally, historical interpretations. And what we're going to focus on here is uh, the question about who or what caused the civil war. So who or what caused the civil war and uh, pretty much who was to blame for the civil war. We'll start with the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. For them, and I'll just read the passage and then we'll explain it. Thus, already in the first half of 1918, two definite forces took shape that were prepared to embark upon the overthrow of the Soviet power, namely the foreign imperialists of the Entente, and, and they are the French and the British, and their allies, and the counter-revolutionaries at home, all those white generals, Duncan and so forth, plus the cadets and the SRs, etc. The desperate struggle waged to overcome the incredible difficulties of that period showed how inexhaustible is the energy latent in the working class and how immense the prestige of the Bolshevik party. So from the official history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the group who was to blame for starting the civil war were these foreign imperialists and the white counter-revolutionaries, not the Bolsheviks themselves. Shula Fitzpatrick. The Bolsheviks saw it, the Civil War, as a class war, both in domestic and international terms, Russian proletariat against Russian bourgeoisie, international revolution as exemplified by the Soviet Republic against international capitalism. So it was a fight between workers against capitalists, 
not only in Russia, but throughout the world. Russia was the sh just the beginning of it. And Richard Pipes. So, for Richard Pipes. Uh, to Lenin, it, the Civil War, meant the global class conflict between his party, the vanguard of the proletariat, and the international bourgeoisie. Class war in the most comprehensive sense of the term, of which the military conflict was only one dimension. He not only expected civil war to break out immediately after his taking power, but took power in order to unleash it. For him, the October coup d'etat would have been a futile adventure if it did not lead to a global class conflict. So what uh, Richard Pipes is saying here, or Richard Pipes, is saying he's uh, laying uh, blame for starting the Civil War pretty much at the feet of Lenin. He's la blaming Lenin for starting the Civil War because Lenin, uh, he's saying after the October Revolution, uh, Lenin not only expected a Civil War to break out, but he wanted to unleash it, okay? He wanted this civil war to occur in order to wipe out his enemies, the bourgeoisie and other counter-revolutionary groups. So that is your, there are your three historical interpretations. And that is the end of our discussion of the Russian civil war. Hopefully it's been helpful for you and I will see you next time.